Hello and welcome to Wake and Jake, the night before football and all through the house. Uh, it's Wednesday, September 4th. Summer is over. Labor Day has happened. There's real football games that count tomorrow night and Friday in Brazil. Uh, football season, you guys know I like to preview the weekend for you. I'm also going to open with kind of a, I don't want to say a Yankee rant because that sounds kind of clicky. Uh, but I also want you guys to reach out and comment kind of about your front office and some of the decisions that have been made or haven't been made that have frustrated you about your team. Because, again, being locked into the Yankees every day um, for the past seven years, there's things that frustrate you and call up this guy, don't call up that guy, uh, make that happen that you guys know on your team better than me. I know a couple from around the league that I want to use as examples. Um, but... Uh, and then that will lead uh, into this football weekend. And I'll give you guys uh, just some of my thoughts on teams or players that I've bought into um, going into this season uh, or something I'm about or I'm not about. So with that, uh, let me start off by saying we were live uh, on the Yes Network alt stream, Yankees Entertainment and Sports Network. Uh, we are friendly with them. Because uh, of where we have ended up as a company, and we've partnered with them, and it's been pretty cool. They put our best of talking Yank show on there. A lot of good people, a lot of passionate Yankee fans. Uh, a couple times we have we've felt, uh, you know, a couple tweets or different things that they weren't the biggest fans of, um, because we're not Yes Network. Um, we're John Boy Media. Um, that on the live stream last night. Uh, Clay Holmes gives up a walk-off grand slam, his 11th blown save of the year. Uh, and Jimmy Jimmy let it eat a little bit. I mean, again, nothing over the top and nothing wrong, to be frank. Uh, and we tweeted it out and all that. And we didn't, I, again, to be fair to yes, like they didn't come at us for this, but it's just, um, they, they've said nothing. Uh, they're, <laughs> I think a lot of the yes people have similar thoughts. They just don't really have a platform to put it out on. It's just not what you would hear on, like, the broadcast, but it's also the point of bringing the us whole in thing. for the altcast. That's so. how alt, alt, altcast, altcast uh, oh. exist. So, um, and, you know, we're sitting there. The Yankees just gave up first place to the Baltimore Orioles, which, again, think of the first world problem that is. Um, but it's just highlighted for us, um, you know, we've, we've had our questions about the front office or different philosophies on the way, and you do have to check yourself sometimes because it's being a fan, and you can't just cut every player after a bad series. That's not how the world works. I get that. And baseball is unique in its own way. Like, you know, we see it every year. Guys have awful one month or two months and then go nuts. Look at Eugenio Suarez. Uh, I mean, the Arizona Dimebacks were... Very ready to move on from him if they needed to, if he didn't kick in in the next couple weeks or whatever. And then he did, and he's been like a one-dot OPS guy for them. Uh, and that's kind of where the Yankees are at with Glaber Torres. Uh, Glaber Torres, who the Yankees had rumored to trade uh, a year and a half ago, a year ago, of uh, Pablo Lopez, it fell through. Uh, looking back, that would have been probably a great trade for the Yankees. Uh, Glaber Torres hit really well last year. He's the most consistent on the team, hitter on the team, not named Aaron Judge, 800 OPS. Like, numbers vary in line with his career numbers. For a second baseman, it's, it's a good ask. Final year of his contract, the defense has never been there, which I was having a laugh about that he struggled with defense at second base when the Yankees thought for a while he would be a shortstop, which that's like a scouting error. Anyways... Uh, Glaber Torres has kicked into gear. They put him in the leadoff spot in front of Soto and Judge. He has been great lately. And it's a, it's a great example of like how the baseball gods can work in sticking with players. And again, I would love to know your team's examples of this, and we can cross-check them and compare. Uh, on the other side, Alex Verdugo, the left, left fielder for them. One year, one year Yankee. Traded from the Red Sox. The Yankees and Red Sox don't do a lot of business. Alex Verdugo was traded for Greg Weiser, a triple-A reliever for them, uh, who's been solid for the Red Sox this year. Happy for Greg. More built for the Red Sox. Looks like a Red Sox. Nice mustache. Times have gotten to check it out. It, it, it looks right. Fits the vibe, man. Um, but think about that. The Yankees and the Red Sox traded. 
a starting left fielder, a piece that they originally traded for for Mookie Betts. Uh, the Red Sox were ready to let whatever happened with Alex Verdugo happen with the Yankees. Uh, he came up and he started pretty solid for the Yanks. He actually took over the cleanup spot for a little bit, was playing great defense in left field. Sure. Uh, and then Yankee fans, you were looking at the numbers and you're like, I think there's more in there. Looking at his baseball card, you think there's a little more in there. It's gone the opposite di- direction. Uh, we got numbers from Katie Sharp. We do Sharp stats every week. Um, you know, basically saying he's been the worst left fielder in the league. World Series teams don't have players putting up the stats he has. Um, in the last 10 days, he's contributed a little better. But um, it's brought up some questions with Jason Dominguez, their top prospect in the minor leagues. They've seen Austin Wells take off this year. Uh, Anthony Volpe has been with the big league club, club for two years now and rolling. Um, that the thought of having Jason Dominguez on the team and Alex Verdugo um, and the thought of them even platooning, hey, every two days, Alex Verdugo's always been bad versus lefties. Hey, we've got a, we've got a lefty and a righty today. We're going to give Dominguez two games, see what he's got, and then we'll give Verdugo two or three games, see what he's got. The thought of competition freaks them out, and it doesn't feel right. I get that it's baseball uh, and that you need to let the season run a little bit, but it's not May. It's not June. It's not July. It's not August. Uh, And for whatever reason, this front office is either scared of the media or they're so into player confidence and belief that they get themselves in trouble, which leads to the Clay Holmes situation. Clay Holmes blew his 11th save. Uh, He's a guy that they got in a trade as kind of a reliever project. Uh, They didn't give up really anything in prospect capital. Uh, And they tapped into him. And it's a credit to Matt Blake. And it's something the Yankees 1,000% can pound their chest and say they're good at. They have tapped into a lot of guys in the bullpen. And they've pushed the envelope on it this year. (laughs) And that's Mm. part of the give and shove of baseball. Like, the Yankees traded for Juan Soto. They got Juan Soto. They had to give up a lot of pieces for that. Um, But credit to them on doing that. They had to give up those pieces for Juan Soto. They're paying him for this year. Hopefully, they're paying him for a lot more years. Uh, but in that, it seems they push their relief to the extreme. That Clay Holmes was kind of the only lock coming into the year. Tommy Canely, but he got hurt before the season. Mm-hmm. That it really has been, I don't hate to say ragtag bunch about a bunch of major league relievers that have pitched well this year, but it's a lot but, of projects. But literally several of them, the Yankees acquired them off waivers. Right. Michael Tonkin, who... The Yankees just waived themselves. They got him off Jake waivers. Cousins. He was on the team all year. With Jake Cousins off waivers. Tim Hill. The Luke White Weaver South. off waivers last season. Right. They changed some things, and that's a that one seems to be another W for them. So, but. again, it's, it's the strength of their organization, and they've leaned into that a lot. But now you are in a window where you've paid Aaron Judge a ton of money. You've paid Garrett Cole a ton of money. You traded for Juan Soto. Um, their bullpen looked and felt vulnerable. And just to be honest... And I know the world doesn't work this way anymore. Clay Holmes on the closer vibe train is a 3 out of 10. He's a massive human, so that gives him some points. When you see that coming out of the bullpen, you're like, okay. Not a swagster. Um, His best pitch is a fastball, like a sinker, a contact sinker. His slider has developed and become a better pitch for them, but... Um, I think now that he's been seen around the league, he doesn't hold runners, he doesn't have good control, there's just not enough weapons in there to be a a lockdown consistent closer, especially when your infield defense is weak, which got highlighted on the main stage yesterday, including a play by DJ LeMahieu, 36 years old, playing first base, and has been one of, if not the worst player in baseball this year. Meanwhile, if you look at other teams... The Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, they let Ahmed Rosario go, who they traded for, was hitting 300 on the season, is super versatile, but they grabbed him as insurance for the rest of their team. And they had other teams and trades come through. Tommy Edmond is now back and playing for them. Their whole bench is veteran laden um, with guys that at least have a skill or guys that have given them, like, huge playoff moments. Chris Taylor, Kike, Kevin Kiermeyer, Like, he has his skill. Um, the Houston Astros. 
Earlier this season, released Jose Abreu with thirty million left to pay. Twenty mil this year, maybe fifteen mil next year, something like that. In the neighborhood, mil. whatever whatever the exact um, number is. Former MVP, Jose Abreu. They when that contract came out, everyone thought it was a year too long. Uh, they made the move. Former MVP, well respected guy. Final also, number on him, but he had left thirty point eight million. He also like had a bad year last year, but kicked in in the postseason. So, you know, that's a tricky game. But he's an older player. An exercise I did the other day, and now I'm starting to wander just a little bit before I get to football season. DJ LeMay, he's 36. I'm starting to deal with father time, even though I still look... I get some early 20s. Often. How, how old, Let me guess how old you are. Why does that happen to me either way? The fact people are doing that to me means they know I'm older than I look. Like, the fact... That someone else would bring that up to me in a conversation means the math is off. Anyways. Because it, that's even come up. You have to kind of not know the person that well. So if you go to baseball reference, you can pick when it lists the player's birthday, you can list players that are born a certain year. E.J. LeMay, he was born in 1988. Yearly close to mine, 1989. These are the players that played this season that were born in 1988. I'll skip the pitchers for you. Kurt Casale uh, picked up off the streets from the Giants because they needed a catcher. Um, I believe he is, he's .2 war, uh, but that's all defensive. Uh, my guy, Kurt Casale, has a 486 OPS. A 44 OPS plus. Okay, sure. Um, Adam Duvall, who's put together a couple good seasons recently, uh, he has a negative 1.3 war this year, a 57 OPS plus. Okay, not looking good. Yasmani Grandal, you a tits man or a yas man? He has a negative war. He has an 81 OPS plus, a 650, 656. Okay. Uh, DJ LeMayhew, negative 1.6 war. A 50 OPS plus, a 527 OPS. No bueno. Uh, Tommy Pham, obviously, Tommy Pham is on this list. Um, Tommy Pham does have a negative war this year, 0.3, uh, with a 96 OPS plus. Tommy Pham's still fighting the fight versus lefties, my guy. Um, the only offensive player that bucks the 88 trend at all is Starling Marte, who has been hurt for a chunk of this season, is one of the most in-shape baseball players I think we've ever had. And Starling Marte has a 104 OPS+. plus, So I wouldn't say he's exactly taking down the world. He has 0.5 war. So I think if you added up the war from the baseball players born in 1988, position players, it would be negative. The Yankees have continued to roll DJ LeMahieu out there. It's almost become rude to DJ LeMahieu. It feels like he's a shell of himself. I know he's a two-time batting title. I know he was a light in a couple of those Yankee years where he was just an, as electric as a player like DJ LeMahieu could be. It was awesome to watch. It forced the hand of the Yankees to re-sign him that they did. And they extended it to a longer contract because they were worried about how he would age, and they would hope it would turn into a bench role eventually, where he would be a backup first baseman, third baseman, maybe second base. It just hasn't happened. Um, and having him in the field late in the game, he misses not even a routine ball, less than routine, like a chopper, basically a game of catch. Like an, an easy play. The office makes that play. Joseph Solano makes that play. There might have been some lights involved. I get it. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, but when you put it with the offensive stats, you put it with the fact he was never really a first baseman. Um, and you have your... A guy that could potentially be the fourth best player on your team in your minor leagues. But you don't know. Because you haven't played him. Because you have another veteran for one year that you're not committed to 
that the Red Sox traded you. The Red Sox willingly traded you because this guy's had his stuff going on. And you're not willing to get your top prospect in the mix when you're in an AL East pennant race with the Baltimore Orioles that could put you in a three-game wild card or not? Unserious has been a word thrown around a lot. Um, I mentioned some of the moves that the Dodgers uh, and Houston have done. The Baltimore Orioles have sent down Jackson Holiday when he came up and he didn't contribute. The Yankees, when Volpe came up, they gave him a full extended leash. Yet other prospects, Jason Dominguez, they can't get anything. Clay Holmes, they tried to convince themselves he was the best closer in the league. For... For what? I think it was a month or like three weeks. Every time a player did an interview, they went out of their way to say that Clay Holmes is the best closer in baseball. It was clearly like a an organizational line. Like a that. memo went out, and that's kind of how they do it. Um, by the way, go check out what Emmanuel Class A is doing this year, so if you really want to get into that kind of argument. Anyways... They basically tried to will the fact that Clay Holmes is a good closer into existence. Uh, And he started off the season great. And Clay has some, it's nasty. I used to call him robot horse uh, because he has the legs of a horse. um, And he was throwing strikes. That was his big problem in Pittsburgh. And guys couldn't find it. Guys have started to find it. They've seen Clay Holmes. It's a sinker slider. Um and I think with the stuff around the league these days and with having seen a pitcher multiple times, it's just not as good as it needs to be to hold on to that closer spot. He also gives up a lot of weak contact with a bad defensive infield. He cannot field because he's built like a robot horse hmm. that the Yankees were in denial about his struggles because it was a lot of weak contact. And, oh, it's a hit. It's, it's an infield single. It's a walk. And then there comes the big hit. Aaron Boone, it's a line he kept using, and it didn't make me mad until it made me mad, that Clay Holmes last year, he had some serious control problems. Like, you would watch his first two pitches, and you'd go, oh, my God. He would have days that you would, like, know, oh, he doesn't have the zone today. He couldn't find the zone. He'd start getting the bullpen up instantly, and that's whatever. So Boone, in his press conferences, would say, like, you know, Clay's been, he hasn't had any of the wild, the control issues this year. And I was like, okay, you know, you're right, Boone. And then... When you take a step back and you realize what he's doing now, uh, because after an incredible start to the season, uh, which I want to get my stats right here, uh, he opened up the season on a scoreless streak. His first 20 appearances were scoreless. That's good. Incredible. Incredible. Until May 19th, he was scoreless. Uh, Since then, and does May matter in your team season right now? No. No. It's over. It's September. A whole summer has happened. Uh, in 35 innings, he has a 5-1-4 uh, ERA. Um, with, like, a 279 batting average against, a 348 OBP, a 762 OPS. If I bring those numbers in a little more, they get worse as the season goes. So, when my guy Aaron Boone, who we talk to once a week, says, yeah, but Clay's not dealing with the control issues. Okay, then that means he's just getting beat at regular baseball. What you thought was his flaw isn't happening, and now he's getting beat at baseball. So by trying to blindly convince themselves that he was a lockdown elite closer, they now have not given anyone else a try at closing this year, which maybe it wasn't the right move. Maybe Luke Weaver's not ready for it. Maybe Jake Cousins is not ready for it. I don't fully believe the Yankees wanted to get someone more impactful at the deadline. We saw the Padres add two significant arms. Um, AJ Puck, again, I don't know if that's a Yankees guy, but for how good he's been for the Diamondbacks, yo. Um, you could you could have gotten someone. Instead of a guy like Peraza is a big was a big prospect for them. He's now kind of down and out on it on their prospect pipeline. We'll see if he gets in the mix next year. But I would have loved to find out him playing more baseball in the last couple years. That between Volpe and Glaber, there would have been different moments you could have played Donaldson. that guy more. 
and you could have known what you had. And maybe he's an option come the postseason. Maybe he's not, and that's okay because his value you can know at, that his value at AAA is doing nothing. They close off doors to themselves, um, and it gets them in more trouble than they think it's helping by saying Volpe's locked in at shortstop every day. Well, he's really struggling. Get him some help. All right, Clay Holmes is our closer. He's struggling. Get him some help. They, Try other options. With Clay, they've, in previous years that he's been the Yankees closer, they've put him in timeouts for two weeks. Like, they've, they've done it with him before. At the deadline, look, obviously we don't, you don't know exactly how any conversations went and what moves were close and just didn't work out for X, Y, Z, but Cashman said closer wasn't at the top of his, you know, priority list, whatever exactly he said. And, you know, they... But but even in the world that they've drawn up, and I'm and I like Clay. I think he's a good reliever that is capable of closing some games. But but even in, in that world that they've writ, drawn up, that he's the best in the world. Even if that's true, why didn't they go about the deadline preparing for like, okay, well, what if he gets hurt? Like they all since April, we've been saying we'd love a reliever that can like day one you're, you feel good about. Eighth inning or later, like just they needed depth back there. Just, just anyway, every team does. Hey, half of you are listening, and your team's out of the playoff mix, and <laughs> you can't believe this. Um, again, I would love to know what your teams are going through. Um, as we're in September, this is the final run. Uh, Orioles also demoted Craig Kimbrell, a store closer from the closer role this year, and there was no problem because it's baseball, and that's how it works. Um, they've gone too far away from competition, and it feels weird. Um, the other thing I'll say, Jazz Chisholm, who has been awesome for the New York Yankees, one dotting. The conversation yesterday, he's the most athletic Yankee since blank. We said Brett Gardner. He has a conversation. A young Brett Gardner could fly around the bases. Um, you know, I, when I say athletic, especially when it comes to baseball, like arm strength, I think becomes involved in it a little bit. And just like how you move, like – how fluid are you around the bases? How well can you feel different positions? Um, I think peak jazz would take on peak guardy, depending how you do your baseball athleticism. The name John threw it out, and I would love to get any other names along the way, is Alfonso Soriano, which we're going back 20 years now. So I realize, you know, baseball kind of gets laughed at for its athleticism sometimes. The Yankees sign free agents, which that brings you into the later part of your career, which makes you less athletic. But... It could be something else that Yankee fans look back at and they're like, wait, why didn't we have more athleticism on the field? Glaber mm-hmm. Torres has been a plodding middle infielder. That's normally pretty athletic. And uh, as you were talking, the Jazz Chisholm like, kind of brand of athletic. Like, of course, like Aaron Judge is an athlete and all, all that. Right. Like, before like that well, comment even comes in. Every baseball player is like, athlete. Obviously. But being athletic is different. Um, it's like, speed, like, it's power, it's it's... Lateral movement, it's how you run, it's it's jumping, it's everything, throwing. Just making um, things happen, which Jazz does every day. And he sure has. Um, so, again, a little bit of a Yankee rant. I'm sorry some of you hate that, some of you love that. Let me know where your team is at, especially I'd love to hear from some of the other contenders of things that are making you mad. Maybe a Dodgers fan is about to chime in in the comments and be like, I hate all the veterans on the bench. Give kids a shot. I don't know. Let me in. Let me in. I would love to find out. And the bigger thing is we're about to find out about football season. Uh, we have the first game of the night, Thursday, Baltimore versus Kansas City. They're running it back in Kansas City at Arrowhead Stadium, NBC and Peacock. Um, man, Kansas City Chiefs, they're going for a three-peat. It hasn't been done in the NFL. A lot of people are buying in because of Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and Kelsey and a defense that's underrated every year and wide receivers that are better. The fun line of the offseason with the Chiefs, they're better than last year. Um, I mean, I kind of believe, I think if, if I had to put betting money on it with the DraftKings Sportsbook, it's hard for me to go against Kansas City Chiefs. Um, Baltimore, what's going to be really fun this year is Derrick Henry. I mean, you probably know from your fantasy football but Derrick Henry is out of Tennessee. He's with Lamar Jackson. 
Um, say Flowers should take off to another level this year and be the best wide receiver Lamar's had. Uh, Mark Andrews has had some health stuff, but Isaiah Likely has filled in really well there. They are set up to be as dynamic as Baltimore's ever been or just impossible to defend. Uh, and what a way it would be to make a statement, uh, kind of like the Lions did last year. And do the Ravens really need to make a statement statement? Like, the Ravens are one of the best teams in football. I, I forget who I was hearing talk about it, but they were talking about, you know, the Chiefs are the standard right now. It's Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, and just that whole organization. And they were talking about, like, if you're ranking teams, it's basically there's a group of teams that you need Mahomes to have his B game and, like, we could win. And then there's a group of teams that just look at it like, no, we can't. <laughs> we can't keep up with this. Uh, the Ravens are obviously one of those teams. Uh, and I'll probably wrap up with some division stuff because I want to walk us through the weekend of football again. That's always one of my favorite things to do. Friday, September 6th, where else would the NFL be but Sao Paulo, Brazil. See you down there. Uh, where the Eagles are hosting the Green Bay Packers. I mean... Philly, who's been one of the highlight teams of the past two years, uh, and the Green Bay Packers, who seem to be all the way back on the map. Jordan Love, with half a season from the gods. Uh, he has been one of the hottest debate topics of this offseason. Uh, is he for real? Um, I guess if, the, if everyone was coming in at an 8 on Jordan Love right now, like an 8 out of 10, like they kind of believe he's that next tier one of the guys, I'm going to sell a little bit. I need to see more. Like, Lafleur's a good coach. It seems like they did it right with Jordan Love. It seems like they believe in one of those wide receiver offenses where everyone in the fantasy draft is debating who's going to be their guy. Feels like Watson. Um, I don't know. I, I think every QB takes a little bit of a step back. Or we're about to be entering a new, like, glory quarterback generation with some of these young quarterbacks because I know we're not talking Texans right now, but, man, everything on paper tells you that they'd be incredible. Like, they added Stephon Diggs. How good Stroud was last year. Like, there's no way he can take a step back, right? I feel like defenses find tendencies, and they can adjust better than quarterbacks, and that's why we end up with Trevor Lawrence's and Justin Herbert's. That Those guys were supposed to be the next generation, right? And now people are kind of selling their stock. So I think I'm a little lower on Jordan Love than probably the consensus is. I'm not saying, like, sell all your stock, but I just need to see more of it. I, I can't be in on that much. Philadelphia, on the other hand, my God, they have been a fun conversation with how ugly their season has ended. Supposedly Hurts and Sirianni had beef. Supposedly it's over. They had Saquon Barkley. I think they just got away from running the damn ball. Like, you used to turn on an Eagles game, and it was third and one, and you were like, even if we stop them, they're going to tush-push us, and we're screwed. Because they would just run the ball. They would cycle in all those different running backs. You never knew who it was unless it was the Giants and it was about to be Boston Scott week. Um, they signed Saquon. They paid Saquon. Saquon's a stud. Saquon's been playing on a tough offense, if we're being honest, the past couple years. They're going to give Saquon the rock. That's going to open it up for Hurts on the outside with all those talented receivers. People are wondering if Philly's going to be out I think Philly's going to be back in a big way. I don't see one of those teams really stepping up in the division. I love Jaden Daniels, uh, but even if I love him, the commanders, and being a year or two away at least, um, I think the Eagles are going to be back in a big way. I don't know what's going to happen in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Feels like one of those games you turn it on, and they're like, the altitude is 70,000 feet. And you're like, what? First game of the year? These guys can't breathe? Um, BBD is going to get the Sao Paulo altitude. Uh, that's a weird one for me. Two, like, kind of historic NFL teams open up in Sao Paulo. Grow the game, right? I guess week one, just get it over with. We have an altitude. I, th I think this is a high altitude. Okay. 2,500 2, feet. I'll take it. Uh, I think that's okay. That's half a mile, right? I think so. I'm a numbers guy. Uh, so let's see. So you got two fun ones. Thursday. Baltimore, Kansas City, Green Bay, Philly. All these teams have championship-type aspirations, which means you turn on the football Sunday, 1 p.m. We're going to be live streaming. Come enjoy with us. Um, let's see, in that 1 o'clock slate, again, you're watching every game. You want to see every team. Your winners 
Uh, Buffalo, Arizona. Let's see what Arizona looks like. Uh, Kyler Murray, Marvin Harrison. That team was really punchy last year. Uh, and the Bills, they're down some of the talent on the outside. Um, but they have Josh Allen, and they're the Buffalo Bills. That Some people have them as a sneaky, could they take a step back? I'm not a McDermott guy. I've talked about that with the Buffalo Bills before. Um, I want to look at the division a little more before I fade the Bills. I'm in on them. I've I got Josh Allen in a few fantasy leagues. The man. Tennessee and Chicago. People will be watching that. Will Levis versus Caleb Williams. Um, I flip-flop on the Bears and Caleb every day. The talent is crazy. Three wide receivers, two running backs they like. Caleb Williams. Every scout and person I trust in the NFL says this guy is going to be the guy. We kind of did that with, like, Trevor Lawrence a little bit. It's a little different. Caleb's got a little more, I think, natural talent to him and showed just a little more two years ago at USC. I think I've told the people on here, I'm not fully sold on Caleb. Um, you need a, man, a, a lot of men in that locker room to buy in. It's got to happen kind of quick. The Bears are a little bit of a cursed quarterback franchise. Like, I don't know what you want to hear. Um, that I don't know. I hope I'm bloody wrong. What is that? That's for one of the British games coming up. I hope I'm bloody wrong. I hope the Bears have their quarterback for the next 20 years. I hope America becomes the biggest Caleb Williams stands. Heard a few of an interview. Like, awesome guy. He's got some, like, anti-bullying foundation stuff. Like, want to be all in on it. Uh, the product of football as a quarterback in Chicago, being a rookie, it's just so uphill for things that shouldn't matter. And I'm skeptical of that. Maybe that makes me the bad guy. Houston Indy could be fun. Feels like they always have a fun game. New England Cincy, kind of out on. Sorry. Everyone wants to see Joe Burr. I get it. Is Jamar going to be out there? New England. Brissett. We'll check in on them later. Uh, Houston versus Indy. I said it with Stroud before. Like, it's either Stroud is absolutely next. Like, I think everyone kind of has them ranked as his, their fifth best QB in football, what he did last year. It's nothing at him. I just believe NFL has a natural regression or we've like found the guy that's going to go toe to toe with Mahomes. Um, I don't know if anyone could go toe to toe with the Mahomes though. So that's where I kind of fade the fade, but they're going to open in Indianapolis. Uh, Houston's tools on paper just seem great. NFL has a weird thing with super teams ever since that one Philly team. Uh, AR five is back for the Colts. God, that might be the game I'm most excited for in the 1 p.m. slate. Definitely. Jacksonville, Miami. I'll be honest. Miami kind of lost a lot of people by the end of last year. Let's see if they're back to being the greatest show on turf and what Jacksonville and if Trevor Lawrence can find it again or buy back in a little bit. Uh, New Orleans, Carolina. Just no. Let's get those red zone clips. And kind of same with the Giants in Minnesota, if we're being honest. It's just being honest. Um Let's see if Malik, Malik Neighbors has something special. We're obviously watching all the top players. Um, Sam Darnold, his rookie year with Minnesota. Let's see what he's got. Everyone loves him. That's your 1 o'clock slate. 4 p.m., my Broncos at Seattle. Sure. I feel like we've seen that before. Um, I'm not in on my Broncos until they bring me back in. The sick part with sports is they win one game against Geno in Seattle and a new coaching staff. And I'll be in. Um, but I'm just not in yet. Although, people have been doing the like, well, Bo Nix has been showing more than we thought. I just need to see it. I'm kind of all in on the Chargers. The Harbaugh thing. Everywhere he goes, he makes better. There's not a lot of guys that you can look at their resume and say that. Um, and he has Justin Herbert. Like, Harbaugh is the perfect man for that franchise. A sneakily cursed franchise for a little bit. Um, that I'm in on them. They open with Vegas. I mean, it is funny. I gotta, I gotta find out who said the line. Uh, I was in one of the fantasy football shows, uh, and the guy said they were like, people are talking about Justin Herbert and the Chargers' passing offense like they're Navy college football, like they're running a triple option. Like, yeah, they're gonna run the ball. You have to pass in today's NFL, and they have Justin Herbert. I know he's a little banged up, but we saw that guy tough it out big time. Uh, and what Harbaugh is, uh, I am all in on the Chargers. 
I think their Vegas win total is like eight and a half. I would be, I might be in on that after recording this. Uh, Cleveland and Dallas, I don't know. Cleveland, two and a half point favorites at home. Uh, that Cleveland defense is for real. Uh, this could be an ugly one. I mean, Deshaun's final ride, potentially. Uh, it's been a lot of bad football out of him. With Dak and Dem boys, uh, that feels like a must-watch for all the wrong reasons. Washington at Tampa. Not too much. I'm lo- I-, I love Jaden. I want to see what he looks like as a pro. I'll check in on that. People are selling pretty hard on Tampa for this year. I think that they had a lot of luck in there. I don't know. Maybe Baker found a second home, and they got something going on. But that's not a game you're excited to watch. Uh, unlike the 8 p.m., where the Rams and Lions are going to run it back. They played in the playoffs last year. Goff and Stafford, quarterbacks traded for each other. The same cities. Uh, Detroit, with all the hope in the world. Don't be shocked if that's a fun one. I mean, a lot of fun. Uh, The rumor is the Rams are going to hammer the run this year, uh, and they're really good at that. With Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup on the outside, a lot of experts think they're going to be the best play-action team in the league. because they got a smart veteran quarterback in Matthew Stafford. They're going to commit to the run. McMay's great at the run. He's great at drawing up plays. Uh, The Lions, they got a taste, right? If you believe in kind of that NBA, you need to get a taste to get over the hump. NFL doesn't exactly work that way, but God, do they believe in what they're doing. Uh, It's going to be some knockout, dragout football. And I don't be surprised if that game is electric and football is back full tilt. Sao Paulo on Friday. Chiefs in Baltimore on Thursday with a full slate ending with that game. Football finds a way. And then Monday night, Jets, 49ers in San Francisco. Rodgers is back. Uh, The San Francisco, Monday night football again? Jesus. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm always in on the Niners. I, I I think they've just become just moments away from getting it done. I think they have all the talent. I think the line's a little thinner than past years, but Trent Williams is back. He said he came back um, after my guy. I told I told you guys about my fantasy draft, and I mentioned one potential sleeper. It was Ricky Pearsall. Uh, he got shot. Tough. He's okay. I think he was back practicing, so that's crazy. Like, in the abdomen, too. Crazy world. Uh, Trent Williams said he came back because, it's like, life's bigger than that, which, whoa. You wonder if a team rallies around that. Um, I don't know. The Jets' defense... Still supposed to be special. Still might be, especially with Rodgers at the helm. Um, I'm going to believe in the San Francisco 49ers. I think I got them at minus three and a half for our DraftKings against the spread league uh, where I had first picked because I've won it back-to-back years. Braggadocious. Um, Let's see. I'll just do a quick final around the horn of the divisions. AFC East, uh, Bills. I do think the Jets have a chance to click. Maybe I'm dumb. Like, maybe Rodgers is old and he hasn't been good in a little bit and it's just going to be jetsy as it getsy. I'm not in. I'll ride with Josh Allen till I die. AFC North, man. God, I hope that becomes electric again. Um, I don't know what to do. I love the Browns coach, Stefanski. Tomlin finds a way to get 500 or better. The Bengals, we did this last year. Burrow went out when they had Joe Burr. He's that guy in the Baltimore Ravens. AFC North football uh, is alive and well. I wonder if the Steelers just have the bad year. Russ has been awful. And he kind of got handed the gig. It has to happen at some point. No coach is invincible. But then they have stupid numbers with TJ Watt on the field. Like, he's their quarterback. (laughs) Um, And Russ was getting the ball to players safely in Denver but they didn't have the playmakers, and this team kind of does. So, I don't know. I wish I could write them off. Uh, Gun to my head, I'd go Baltimore. Lamar's that guy. Derrick Henry. The defense is gross. AFC South. Will Levis? Do I have a dark horse team? I'm not in on the Colts, which my two Jonathan Taylor fantasy drafts would tell you differently. I'm not in on the Colts. I do think Houston Houston will not be bad. I'm kind of out on the Jags. 
Titans, I have no clue. I mean, new head coach. Will Levis, I want to like, but he gets hurt, and I don't know if he's good. My AFC West, it's the Chiefs. The Chiefs and the Chargers coming out. Bet on both of them to make the playoffs. Broncos and Raiders, my God. Uh, In the NFC, Eagles easy. I guess I've been out on the Cowboys. I don't know. Is that me just fading America's team? Do I not believe in Dak? I think the Eagles are going to be back. They finished so poorly last year. I mean, it obviously leaves that window open for chaos to happen and it ending miserably. But, God, they're so talented that it just can't. Um, and the Cowboys, I feel like they could get thin quick. If they, like, if they were to lose CeeDee Lamb for three weeks, their offensive options... It's not what you'd expect from the Dallas Cowboys. NFC Norris division. I have this getting ugly. I think the Lions come back to earth a little bit. I think the Bears have a little more sauce in them. I think the Packers are consistently okay. And I think the Vikings, I, tall head coach. Yeah, told you guys. Um, some of the Justin Jefferson numbers. Um... Kevin O'Connell, KOC. Um, They had nobody's playing quarterback last year. Justin Jefferson still put up numbers. Um, I think he's a really good head coach. I could see that being a sneaky division where all the teams end up over 500. Do I believe in that? I do right now. Why not? Hot takes? Not at all. Um, NFC South, the Atlanta Falcons are the team that nobody... Nobody knows. Kirk's never been bad. The Falcons, starting quarterback, got cut this preseason. Couldn't get a backup gig. So you're bringing in Kirk Cousins. They have the weapons. I'm, I'm a seeing is believing guy, so I'm, I'm willing to be wrong on it, but I'm, I'm not in on Atlanta. I think they'll be better. Like, I think Kirk will be Kirk. Um... I don't know. I've seen the Kyle Pitts experiment too much, and maybe the quarterbacks have been that bad, and he's a stud, and he'll bounce back. And People like Drake London, and he was still fine with bad quarterback play. I get it. Um, Bijan and how they mismanaged him last year. I get it. All the boxes to check are there, and maybe I shouldn't. Because, I don't know. Who are the two teams last year that everyone thought were going to kick into gear? I think it was the Lions... Everyone was in on, and there was an AFC team. Um, I'm blanking. Not not the Chiefs. Um, and it kind of came to came to fruition. Or two years ago, it was Philly and the Vikings. Oh, everyone yeah. was like, "These two teams are great. It's going to happen." Pretty much everyone's in on the Falcons because every box you click there should be better. That division gets ugly, and a new team takes over every year. So the stars are all pointing to Atlanta. Um, I'm skeptical. I just haven't liked what's gone down there the past couple years so much that, hey, maybe it's a breath of fresh air and Kirky's great, new staff, all of it. Um, It's right in front of them. It's right in front of them. It's tough because who are you going to be into? Give me the Bucks and Baker just becoming pests. Mm. Mike Evans is still there. Baker can get a ball to a best wide receiver. Godwin's still around. They don't hate their tight end. White, the running back, is okay. <laughs> uh, and that just might be enough for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, so I guess that would be a hot Jake. The NFC West, I love the Niners. I think they are just a program. And everyone's in on the Rams, and I'm in on them too. I'm not going to fight that. I think Stafford, this could potentially be like a last ride. I think they've loaded up on the offensive weapons. They figure it out on defense. Cardinals will be fine until Kyler gets banged up. And I... I love I love watching him play when he's healthy and good. Um, Seattle, they're just in a weird middle class right now. That's kind of nothing. So that was a little bit around the league. I told you guys I'm going to bring in more football people during the weeks to break it down and get into it. Because like I've told you, I watch it at the fan level, guy at the bar, track pretty closely, know a lot of the names and places. Um, it's also just a losing game. Because uh, I was listening to... An, uh, another guy who comes out with the top 100 players list every year, and he's like, it's my favorite piece to do. 
And he goes, by midseason, I wish I could delete it off the internet. Mm. Uh, football in every sport moves pretty quick. Uh, the good news is, for two months, football and baseball. Yeah. Whoa. NBA will be sneaking up. I don't know if it's a sports apocalypse. I think October it is. I think you oh, get October. one of, you when, get when one of those days. It's like we've got all four games on one day. Um, can't wait. Bart Scott. Uh, come check it all out with us. They're going to be streaming the football games tomorrow. I'll be there Sunday. Um, Guess I will be too. Get ready for some football, everyone. Um, enjoy it. Sorry about the Yankees rant. Tell them about Uncle Dan. Wake and Jake is a production of Dan Patrick Productions, John Boy Media, and Workhouse Media.